So now is the time. So now is the time for the message. Yay. All right. Thank you. No. All right. Now is the time. God has set eternity in our hearts. But today I want to look at the season for all things and our title being restoration. But in that place of restoration, I want to talk about judgment. Judgment, heavy subject, heavy subject, but something powerful in its, in its place. Last week, if you remember, I said to you, if I told you a joke, you would laugh. Is that correct? Would I make, well, that's right, maybe, all right. Would I have to make you laugh? No, it becomes a natural, natural part of who you are. A joke is, a, is something that you laugh. I don't have to tell you to laugh if it's funny. Worship should be the same. When we think of God, his majesty, his creation, and his creativity should be a place where we just naturally want to worship. It shouldn't be something forced. So I made that comment, and so then I thought I'd start with a joke today because I've got a heavy-duty subject to go with it. So let me begin with a joke. May I tell you a joke? <laughs> Helen's, Helen's frowning. <laughs> okay, there was a pastor who, uh, who really was a bit discouraged and did not want to go to church and do his sermon on a particular Sunday morning. I'm not talking about me. Just, he didn't, wanna, he didn't want to, to preach or do anything in church. He wanted to go and play golf. So, and Mike's been nodding to that one yet. And so he made a phone call, said to the church, I'm feeling unwell. I can't come in. I can't preach. I'm just going to have a sick day. So he was going to be or stated that he'll be in bed and he'll be sick. But really, he quickly got out the golf bag and went to the golf course. Now, God is standing there in heaven watching as Pastor X didn't go to preach and went to play golf. And Peter was standing next to God saying, are you going to let him get away with this? And God says, well, just watch what I'm going to do. So, Pastor hits the ball, goes flying through the air, hits a tree, bounces down into the gutter, runs across the pathway, a dog picks it up, runs a bit further, puts it on the hill, the wind blows, and the ball finally, finally, finally falls in, and it's a hole in one. And Peter said, what did you do that for? And God said, well, who's he going to tell? Judgment. I just wanted to begin the heavy subject with something of a bit of humor. Lord Jesus, as we come into this time of uh, understanding your word and your truth, may you speak through me to us to hear what you want us say, so that we understand your sovereignty, your wonder, your beauty, and your majesty as you bring life through restoration, and often it's through judgment, and we don't like the judgment. But we know, Lord, you want to restore us. So allow this to happen for each one of us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Judgment. Um, some years back when Helen and I, before we were in uh, ministry and church ministry, we were in a church called uh, Campbelltown Church of Christ in Sydney. And we had a prospective new minister coming to uh, come and, you know, come and preach to the church. And the church was looking for a new senior pastor. And uh, this particular senior pastor came and he preached and the church was happy with him. The leadership was happy with him. And he said to the church, now, if you're happy with me, you have to vote. And as a church, you vote for me to become your new senior pastor. But before before you vote for me, I need to tell you something. 
And the church was listening and we were listening. What's he going to say? And he said, before you vote for me, before I became a pastor, you need to know that I did 10 years for armed robbery. And we all sat there and went, okay, this will be interesting. But you know what? The church did vote for him. And uh, he became our senior pastor for at least 10 years or so, I think 10 or 11 years. And he was, he was a, 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 you know, a great minister. The, way, the reason I'm leading into that story is because there was a place where he had, his life was very different to being a minister, of course, beforehand. But when he went to jail for the armed robbery, he became a Christian. And in jail, he learnt uh, a lot of Bible college things and understanding. His life was radically transformed. But it was through judgment that there was transformation. And through judgment, there became restoration. That's what I want to lead into today. Through judgment, we can find a place of restoration. And we need to understand that. We've been looking at Ecclesiastes chapter 3, as you know, through our title. He said eternity in our hearts. And now I want to pass through eternity, uh, through Ecclesiastes 3 to the second part of this passage. And look what's happening here. So it looks like Solomon writes this as words of wisdom. He writes, what, does, what do workers gain from their toil? I've seen the burden of God laid on the human race. He's made it everything beautiful in its time. He's also set eternity in the human heart. And that's our theme, knowing that God has set eternity in our heart. Yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. We have no idea how grand and wonderful God is and his plan. I know that there's nothing better for people than to be happy and to do good while they live that each of them may eat and drink and find satisfaction in all their toil. This is the gift of God. I know that everything God does will endure forever. Nothing can be added to it, nothing taken from it. God does it so that people will fear him. Whatever is, has already been, and what will be, has been before. And God will call the past to account. And I saw something else under the sun. In the place of judgment, wickedness was there. In the place of justice, wickedness was there. So I said to myself, God will bring, judge, will, God will bring into judgment both the righteous and the wicked, for there will be a time for every activity, a time to judge every deed." So there's a lot in that. It's very compact. So I just want to pull it apart a little bit as we go. God has set eternity in our hearts, yet we cannot fathom what God has done from beginning to end. That already should get our minds racing and, and thinking, you know, how does, how does that work from beginning to end? God's in the center of it all. We can't fathom it nor understand it, but he has put eternity for us to understand that. I know there's nothing better in verse 13 that each of them may eat and drink and find satisfaction in their toil. Who likes eating and drinking? Who likes satisfaction in their work? This is all good stuff. And we need to have that place where we work and find satisfaction, where we find the good and satisfying good things of life. This is the gift of God, to enjoy life. We should be enjoying life. If life is not enjoyable, there's something a little bit wrong. It's a gift of God. I know that everything God does will endure forever. Nothing can be added to it nor taken from it. God does it so that people will fear him. Why do they fear him? They fear him because we need to be in fear, not, not scared, but in awe, that fear, that awe-inspiring seeing God he has everything in control, nothing more, nothing less. The world, the universe, everything is in place that God has put there so that we will fear how mighty and incredible he truly is. And whatever has 
is has already been and what will be has been before and God will call the past into account. God will call the past into account. The things that have gone wrong, God will bring them into account and he will deal with them. And the comment here from this writer is, and I saw something else under the sun, in the place of judgment, wickedness was there. We can look across the world, we can see judgment, we can see wickedness. We can also look for justice and we can also find wickedness in it as well. But I said to myself in verse 17, God will bring into judgment both the righteous and the wicked. For there will be a time for every activity, a time to judge every deed. There will be a time for every activity and a time to judge every deed. God will have the final say and he will be the, the grand jury and the judge. As I said, we don't like judgment because the judgment becomes personal to each one of us. We like the idea of God judging the world and evil and, and things like that, but there is a judgment for each one of us, and we're going to look a bit deeper at that. But before we go there, some other comments. Things that are happening around us, as Malcolm Muggeridge writes, all news is old news happening to new people. Digest that for a moment. All news is old news happening to new people. So the things that we have seen through our world and over the years, the oldest sins done the newest way, committing the oldest sins in the newest kind of way. The human heart hasn't changed. The human heart hasn't changed from the beginning till now. The human heart still has its desires and its weaknesses. The human heart has its temptations and its struggles. So nothing's changed in the, in the world of trouble that we live in. So we need to see it. All news is old news happening to new people. And some of us are like Habakkuk crying out these words, How long, O Lord, must I call for help? But you do not listen. Or cry out to you, violence, but you do not save. Why do you make me look at injustice? And why do you tolerate wrongdoing? Destruction and violence are before me. There is strife and conflict abounds. Therefore, the law is paralyzed and justice never prevails. The wicked hem in the righteous so that justice is perverted. Who can resonate with these words? When we look around us, and see what's happening in the world around us. How long, O oh Lord, must I cry out for help, but you do not listen? How many of us have been in that place where we feel like God's just not listening? Or we're wondering what's happening in our own lives, or happening in our community, happening in this country? We cry out, are you listening? In this case, with Habakkuk, we find this is the state of Israel when we find the Babylonians coming in with a, a major army. A major army was coming into the from the Babylonians to take out Israel because it was finally time for God's judgment. The Israelites were idol-worshipping. As much as God had done miracle after miracle, they were still worshipping idols and false gods. There was injustice and God had to bring a judgment. We're in a season today of godlessness. Wouldn't you say we are? In our society, in our community, what's happening in the world? We're in a place of godlessness. And the way we see that often is, as a community, we've lost accountability. How many of us do things thinking that God is watching us? How many in Parliament House here make decisions 
wondering if God is watching them. <laughs> there might be a few. But we're talking about accountability, making decisions with a godly accountability. Around us, even our own selves, do we make decisions believing God is watching what we're doing even in, in daily things. The trouble that we find is people are trying to get away with things until they're caught. So often it's looked upon as we live in the horizontal. We bounce off other people. We look to other people for our value and esteem and we look to other people for our relationships. We constantly look around for our accountability if other people are watching us. So we live in a world of these horizontal relationships. But the relationship we should be looking for is our vertical one looking to God. That's right, Paul, looking straight off. It's this vertical relationship how do we make our decisions how do we process how do we work through things we've lost our accountability we've lost our moral accountability and as a community we've lost that and we need to keep our eyes focused firmly on our lord In Genesis 4-6, we find a lot of this coming through. We find this story of Cain and Abel. Straight after Adam and Eve, some of their first children, Cain and Abel. We find this taking place where we find Cain and Abel and the jealousy between them. And God speaking to Cain and saying to him, Why are you so angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. But if you do not do what is right... Sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. Sin is crouching at all of our doors. We must be in a place where we want to do what is right. God is speaking directly to him. But this sin is crouching, it desires to have you. Sin wants to take over. Sin wants us to be in that place where we make our own decisions, not looking for God and what he is trying to tell us. But you must rule over it. Be in this place where you're, you're asking God's help to rule over the sin that you're struggling with and the battle that you're in. As I said, Nothing's changed the human heart right from the first two, Cain and Abel. This place where sin is crouching at the door and you must rule over it. To have that accountability between you and God. Jesus talks about judgment many times. Many times Jesus comes with these statements through his parables and through his words. In Matthew 13, we find the wheat and the weeds. We find this place where both weeds and wheat are growing together. And eventually at harvest time, there needs to be a separation. Luke 12, we find the rich fool who says, I've got these barns that I'm, I'm building. Look how good I am. I'm just going to relax and, and it's not going to happen. God says, no, today I'm, it's going to be taken from you. The wedding banquet in Matthew 22. We find this place where, where people are invited and invited and invited. Come to this special event. God is finally coming to have this banquet. Oh, no, I'm busy, I'm busy, busy. Judgment comes in. The sheep and the goats, Matthew 25, where they're going to be separated. The sheep and the goats, the separation. In, in Matthew 21, the wicked vineyard and the, and the tenants. 
and, and God just talking about this, this, or Jesus talking about how these, uh, these people that have rented the fields have taken over and killed the son that's come to take back the land as, as Jesus is showing that place of, of again of judgment and then the servants and the miners which is the money given and, uh, and what they've done with it. There's a place of judgment. Jesus talks about judgment continuously through his words and his truth. We, we hear the judgment about, about uh, Jesus talking about children, how you treat children and a millstone on the neck if you're not looking after children. And then in, in uh, Matthew 10, Jesus talks about, don't be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Judgment is a big deal. We don't talk about it today in church. We don't, we don't talk about it in communion. We don't talk about things like that. We don't talk about heaven and hell. We don't talk about this ugly, ugly place of judgment. But the truth is, this is the, the gospel or the message that we find continuously through the Bible that God brings judgment to bring restoration. And as I said, we don't like judgment. I remember as a child growing up in church and other places hearing about judgment. And I remember as a child that I was fearful that if I did one thing wrong, I might not make it to heaven. I don't know if you grew up with that too. Some of us, uh, you know, as, as children growing up, are, are always fearful if we did step out of line, we might not make it to heaven. But see, in Habakkuk, we find God responding. Remember I used that passage, how long, O oh Lord, are we look at this? God responds to Habakkuk with this. He says, look at the nations and watch and be utterly amazed. Because I'm going to do something in your days that you would not believe even if you were told. We know that God sent the Babylonians as judgment over the Israelites for all the wrong that they've done. But you know what happens after this response when the Babylonians come in and they destroy Jerusalem and they destroy the temple and other things like that? You know what took place? When the restoration of the people coming back after the judgment God had placed, you know you cannot find anywhere in Scripture after that that they worshipped idols. Finally, through God's judgment, there was a restoration. And as I mentioned, Jesus, who comes to this place where, where he's talk about judgment, 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 you know, God has done something amazing. Through judgment, God brings his own son to bring restoration. We can look at God as being this ogre and this judging God. We can look at God in his anger and, and almost the violence that comes with it, but we've got to understand that God also has the heart to bring life and restoration through judgment. We've got to understand this picture for our own lives that as much as we fear judgment, there's also a place of beauty that Jesus brings the gospel message of hope and life for each one of us. Jesus' joy is not to judge us, but Jesus' joy is to bring hope and restoration to each one of us. In John 3, 17, it says, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Let's change that a little bit and say, For God didn't send his Son into the world to condemn you, but to save the world or you through him. There's something wonderful and beautiful about that. Jesus has come, yes, to talk about judgment, but in his judgment, he talks about restoration. 
In John 16, 33, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. I have told you these things so that you may have peace. But he's talking about judgment. I have come to bring you peace. Because in this world, you're going to have trouble. You're going to have trouble within yourself. You're going to have trouble with things around you. But I've come to bring you peace. Take heart because I have overcome the world. Hallelujah. Are you excited about that? You're looking a bit dull. Come on, look. Take heart. I've come over the, I've come over, I've overcome the world. Jesus has overcome the world. Take heart. I've come to bring you peace. But I'm not negating the judgment that you have to go through so that you will understand I'm here to restore you. There's a season for all things, and that season is restoration. My father, in his dying days, would request a Bible reading, and my brother and I would often read it to him while he was laying there in bed because he wanted to hear these words. In that place of restoration, we find Revelations 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the us, the people. And he will dwell with us, with them. And they will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There'll be no more death, nor mourning, nor crying, nor pain. Hallelujah, those in pain. No more pain, no more tears, no more crying. For the old order of things has finally passed away. My father listened to those words over and over and over again because he was looking for no more mourning, no more crying, no more pain. The old order of things has passed away. He did some years with the army. He saw things that were very, very difficult to deal with. And he wanted a place where there was no more pain, no more death, no more mourning, no more crying. And the old order of things, the rubbish that the world presents in its ugliness, has finally passed away. Jesus being the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, is a beautiful picture. It's a restoration that we need to see for each one of us. And I just want to finish with this one last picture. This picture that I see is this place where somebody who, feeling the pain, feeling older, finding a place finally for restoration. Restoration is a longing that we all have in our own hearts. A restoration with our maker, a restoration with our Lord, a restoration with our Saviour. But restoration can't happen until judgment has taken place. And that judgment is a place where we will find restoration. For all the wrong that's taken place in our own journeys, Jesus rights those wrongs by going to the cross. This is a good story. It's a, it's a love story. The love story where God wants to restore each one of us. And it's beautiful. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, 
It's a love story that you present to us. We often see judgment, the opposite to love. We often see a place where we being judged is a place where we get a bit frightened or a bit scared. But you say you bring us peace because through judgment, things are restored. Through judgment, things become right. And we so long for things to become right. Allow us to understand our own moral accountability where we, where we stand between you and us, that you don't want to condemn us, but you want to set us free, that you want to bring the prison walls that we create around, around ourselves, you want to bring them down, and you want to restore our hearts and our lives. So Lord, let us not fear you. Let us want to be close to you. Let us not be in a place where we're judging others, but let us be in a place where we recognize that life and restoration comes because your mighty hand has given us grace and that grace is loving and that grace is caring and you want to restore and set things anew. Thank you, Jesus, for bringing us hope because I don't know where else we would go into the world to find the hope that you bring to us. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.